and it was the first time I had to pin up my first three weeks work which was reviewed by Norman and others and I thought it was going to go very positively because I thought I'd done really good work and after a few minutes all Norman said well there's one thing I've got to say whatever you've learned in Arab Associates you need to forget it all and start again and he almost kind of ripped up all my drawings because yeah? all these drawings had been done to do with you know thorough but proper detailing or but conventional yeah conventional design and Norm said I'm not interested in that you know and what I learned out of that was is the that Norman questioned everything. I was lucky that, you know, I, I didn't lose my job. He, he respected my technical ability. But it, from then on, it was very difficult. One had to really think afresh and, um, and it was very different. An architect would do a design and a set of plans, almost like creating a sculpture, whatever he was creating and then it would be passed to the engineers to, to make it stand up, to build it. Not really with a dialogue, saying that's what we want, you get on and, and, and structure it and put the pipes and things in it. Um, where Norman had such a different approach, he would want to talk with the engineers before he designed or when he just had a, like a vague idea and to find out what the limitations or opportunities were in the engineering. Norman was interested in what I call the economy of means, in how effortlessly or simply, you know, in the way today minimalism is, is, is very, you know, popular. The Sainsbury Centre that Norman designed was very much um, an open-ended system, I'd call it, that, that structural frame with its atria was logically, it could have been extended like forever. One could have just expanded the existing building like an extrusion. But it was Sir Robert Sainsbury himself said he understood completely the, um, the concept of the building, but he still thought that the form was so beautiful and, and perfect that nothing could be added or taken away without spoiling it extend the basement actually out at the front of the building, maintaining the lawn and the grass, but taking the benefit of the contours which fell away down to the lake, so that you ended up, although it was a basement, you ended up with a whole window wall of daylight facing the, facing the lake. The Hong Kong Bank, which is one of the you know, huge financial institution, which already had the tallest building in Asia, as it was when it was built in 1935. How they, as a board, were willing to give that responsibility to that small office is quite it's astonishing, really. So I think it was quite fantastic that we won that competition. And it was Spencer de Grey and myself who were chosen to go out there to live, to set up the new office. A completely pre-computer era. No emails, no computers at all, yeah? Typewriters to do letters, and all drawings 100% hand-drawn. But the good thing was, because of the eight, eight hours time difference, it almost felt like you could work around the clock, yeah? Because um, when we were finishing work in Hong Kong, London was starting work, and the project was developed both in Hong Kong and London, almost like a continuous 24-hour um, cycle. It was quite remarkable. How the Hong Kong Bank managed to be built from, a, from all those people making components in Japan, America, and so on, and, and it, the steel came from England, I think. The, and it was still built in a, I think the whole thing took about three years to build, which wasn't crazy. Projects of that size still take roughly that long to be built today, even with all the technology. I think there's no doubt that the, um, the technology has produced fantastic benefits. But to me, um, 
I think the architecture of that era pre-computer was still fantastic and in many ways better than what is produced today. I actually think that the, the work Norman did pre-computer is the finest architecture in the world. <laughs>